Hello everyone, let's get started. I welcome you all to today's webinar, how to choose an integration platform vendor to your business. My name, my name is Arunan Sugunakuma. I am a senior software engineer at WSO2. I am working in the integration team. I have Chanaka Fernando with me. He's a solution architect at WSO2. He has experience with our, most of our enterprise customers and he's here to share his knowledge as well. So let's get started. So if we, if we look at today's agenda, so uh, the goal of this webinar is to explain what is integration and why businesses need integration. And we'll look at some of the solution architecture patterns that today's businesses have used in their uh, businesses to deploy these integration platforms. And we'll explain some of the modern integration requirements that you should be looking uh, at when you are evaluating an integration platform your vendor is to your business and we will uh, help you understand what are the uh, qualities that you have to look at an integration platform so that you have can, you can have a smooth cloud native journey in your business and then we'll explain some of the non-functional requirements of an integration platform for example like you, it, it, it is be better to have some of these features in your integration platform, even if you don't have any needs for it today. And finally, we will explain on how to make the final decision so that you can choose a better integration platform so that you can get the best out of it. So let's get started. So let's go through the definition of the integration first. If you look at the definition, uh, integration is the function of connecting disparate systems to exchange data to build a coherent system that produces value to the users. Let's break this definition into two parts. Let's look at the first part. Integration is the function of connecting disparate systems to exchange data. Let's see how these disparate systems came into existence in your business. When you are starting your business, you would have started in a small, smaller scale. So when you are started, you would have only have one system, and it's mainly uh, used. You used it for the to manage your business, manage your business day-to-day -day activities, and you would have like uh, you would have been happy at that time. But then, when you started to grow your business, you would have deployed different systems in your company. For example, you would have uh, deployed the HR system. You would have depo deployed the accounting system. So from time to time, based on your needs, you would have deployed these systems in your company. But these systems might not be having the, using the same protocols or the same data formats. So these, these, I mean, these, thing, these systems are, are different from time to time. I mean, this, this, the technology that is used in this, System might change from time to time, but you so what you started ten years ago might not be the one. Uh, I mean, might not be the best technology for today system. So these systems, the the systems that you are using in your business might be different from each other. So you have this data, right? So if you look at this, the second part of the definition, it, to build a coherent system that produces value to the users. So you have this data. So you are now using an integration platform to connect this disparate system and you are going to build a system that produces value i mean having data is an asset to the company but you need to uh, if you are going to get the best value out of it you need to use that data and get some better value out of it i mean you have to mo modify it or you have to aggregate it to and you have to get uh, and you have to do some modifications to the data to get the best value out of it that's why we need a better integration platform so as i said let's i mean the businesses have different integration needs we can classify these integration needs into four sections like application integration data integration b2b integration and api management if we look at application integration now let's say now you have you have a company okay you you started a company and you have installed a system in your uh, company and you have different uh, and from 
time goes on, you uh, de you deployed different systems for different needs. And now you have uh, installed the integration platform in your company and to connect all these systems. But it, it might not be enough. Like, I mean, we are, we, the goal of a business is to grow, right? So from, from, time, uh, from time to time, we will get different needs to connect different applications. Let's say that you, you now the employee count in your business is increasing. So you need a proper people HR system. So you we would need to connect. You would need to connect to a system like people HR. So so application integration is a must for an integration platform. And the second one is the data integration. As I said, we have data in different systems. We need to connect these different data, and we had to accumulate it so that we can produce a bet, better. I mean, we can get a better value out of it. So we need data integration. And then we need B2B integration. What is B2B integration? It is mainly used, uh, I mean, when you are growing, you, you, won't be a, uh, you won't be an independent company. I mean, most likely you will find a partner for your supply needs, for your delivery needs, you will find a partner. Likewise, business form all kinds of partnership all the time to grow themselves. So when you are having these partnerships, you need to exchange data from back and forth so you need b2b integration and then you need api management why you why you need api management now you have this data right and you need to expose this data to your stakeholders the stakeholders might be internal or external but you need uh, but still you need to expose some of i mean on a access controlled manner you need to expose this data with the, uh, and you need to provide security as well for that you need api management so let's look at some of the functional requirements of an integration platform. So functional requirements are, are the core tasks that you need for, for from your integration platform that you uh, so that you can achieve your integration needs. So the first and foremost need of an integration platform is the data transformation. As I said, we will be storing data across different types and formats, and it will be in different systems, and all these systems might be using different protocols so you need to translate and transform from this data and these protocols so one of the protocol uh, the protocol that we all know is uh, http but it is not the only protocol we might need to use jms we might need to use vfs likewise there are so many protocols out there and we need to transform back and forth between this so that we can accumulate this data and we can provide it to the request i mean the clients that requested it and then we need we need application connectors what are application connectors like i said we we i mean businesses have this application integration need so for that now let's say now we today deploy the integration platform and and tomorrow you are going to uh, you, are, you are you are deploying an application to a company so just because we deployed the integration platform today we can't say that it doesn't have the capability to connect with the application that you are going to deploy tomorrow so the integration platform should have that extension point so that even in future if you are connecting to a new application you don't have to do drastic changes to your existing system you just have to have this connector and you can you are good to go so the integration platform should have the capability to support application connector and then you need to uh, consider the file processing part. So we, I mean, the organization all, uh, always have these large files. They, they might be storing data or they might be storing emails. Likewise, we have these large files. From time to time, we need these files to be processed. We might need them to be stored in a database or we need them to be sent in an email. So likewise, there are several uh, op operations that we need to do on this file files and uh, the integration platform should be able to process the files routing and orchestration so as i said now we have different systems and we have a single integration platform so from time i mean for, for a single operation we might not need to talk with all the systems right so based on the request the integration platform should have the capability to route the request to these different systems and the integration platform should have the capability to support messaging and event handling what are events events are a unit of data so an event might be an sms or an email or some some data uh, some database change 
but these events are continuously happening so the integration platform should have the capability to handle these events and based on that it has to act and it has to do a, a valuable operation and after that we have this the integration platform should have this b2b or edi support what is this so when you are forming a partnership you might be using a protocol uh, your uh, proprietary technology to exchange data between yourself so these data might be, i mean they are, might not be a standard or like you might use you might be using this uh, proprietary standards but then, but then again this integration platform should have the capability to support that and if we look at the event stream processing, so event stream processing is one of the rising technologies that uh, every businesses are using now. And it is the point, uh, purpose of event stream processing is continuously using the, I mean, processing the data that arrive without keep I mean, processing it at the end of the day. So we get the data, we process it, and we uh, get the value out of it at, uh, from then and there, rather than keeping it for a later time. So the integration platform should support that, and then. The integration platform should have the capability to apply api policies and enforce it and manage it because now we are going to expose your data to others maybe partners clients customers but you can't ex 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 expose the data as it is you need to have, have a secure mechanism or a policy to expose this data so that you can ensure that not all parties can access all the data there should be some management applied uh, management that you have to do and the integration platform should provide it out of the box so let's look at this architecture so es an esp is an architecture pattern that company you companies used to have in the past to achieve their integration goals so in esp is an enterprise service bus we you we have have one esp and we connect all to we connect this to all the system so that the users have to request to the ESB and the ESB will talk to these different systems in different formats, different data types, in different protocols, and it will get, get the data, accumulate it, and it will return it to the client. So the client might be talking, we yeah, a load balancer on an API gateway. That's uh, important, but the goal is like we, we have an ESP and we talk with all these systems. It, uh, the systems might be a legacy system or a database or a partner system, whatever it is, we it, the communication will happen via the ESP and the ESP knows how to make this communication. The client doesn't have to ha doesn't have to know, okay, what, are, what is the legacy system protocol? What is the legacy system uh, data format? It doesn't have to know. It just, it just need to know how to talk with the ESP. But nowadays, ESP is not like uh, it's it's not the buzzword as it it was once because it, there are some challenges to ESP because a, a, as I said now ESP is a monolithic architecture right I mean you have one instance of the ESP and you are you are using it to talk with all the systems let's say now we are uh, the traffic is increasing what will happen then you need to scale the ESP right but Sometimes, since the ESB has a monolithic architecture, it is not very easy to scale, and it is not very easy to manage. You might you need to do patching and upgrade from time to time, and there are some challenges because let's say like you you scale now right now scale uh, scaling you can achieve it via two two kinds of scaling uh, vertical scaling or horizontal scale, but the some of the services that are in the ESB might not not capable of either vertical scaling or horizontal scaling because it is very hard the, the nature of the service doesn't allow it so what you do most of the time they we use a vertical scaling so we increase the resources of the esp but that will lead to a resource under utilization because now let's say the traffic is low now you have allocated high resources to the esp but now it is wasted because you have i mean now because the capacity that we have planned is not achieved because the, there is no uh, traffic incoming and the time to market is higher because because the, all the services are in one single esb now you have to test it everything i mean you have to like fr from the start you have to develop everything you have to test it and make sure that everything is working and then you have to deploy it and then only the customers can start using it 
with that with with that approach it is very hard to monitor or troubleshoot let's say like now the if you look at the log file of an esb now you can see that uh, the all the logs the logs will be there for all the services related so the, uh, the traffic the all the, the logs will contain the uh, the stuff from all the services so so if an issue happens we, it is very hard to troubleshoot you know like we don't know okay from which service this issue has occurred or the log belongs to which service it is very hard to troubleshoot and the log file will be very lengthy so if an issue happens it will be very hard to recover as well because now you need to go and check all the services and you need to test it and find out okay why this issue happened so at that time so all the other services also you have to uh, make it inactive so that uh, it will be unavailable for everyone so let's look at some of the solution architecture patterns that are suitable for a current audience like uh, so if you if you look at this architecture layered architecture it is one of the architecture that companies are uh, following nowadays because it is very like, as you see in this diagram we have now separated out the services now we don't uh, deploy all the services in one instance we have separate apis like we, we define separate rest apis and uh, manage it separately we have system apis process apis and experience api we have so let's look at system apis system apis is where you expose the data in a lower level so you have some uh, systems like uh, cloud system databases or mainframes and you expose your data with the system apis as it is in a rest api in a rest manner so that now these system apis will have an interface so all the other systems that are talking that want to get data out of this legacy system they just have to talk to this system api and they can get the data and then you have process apis process api is where you create i mean you use this you use this system api and you you accumulate the data you get and create value out of it so this process api is where you, you do your integration most right you uh, get the data you read that i mean you get the data and you process it you transform it or you do you whatever the uh, operations you want and you make use of it make uh, create value out of it and after that we give this process uh, expose this process apis to the experience api experience api is where the clients will actually uh, you the is where the uh, clients will actually use it and they will they, uh, use it in their uh, services or systems so this uh, the goal of the experience api is to make a user friendly api so that the uh, the end user can have a better experience so they don't have to uh, they don't have to think about uh, the status of the back end system they just have to think about they just have to go and read the definition of the api they can they can use it uh, in a very friendly manner and if if we look at this so this layered architecture now we have we have say, uh, like segregated the uh, responsibilities for each api and different layers can be managed by different uh, parties now the system apis can be uh, monitored or developed by a central it people and then the experience api can be used by the application developers so the we have separated out the api so that it is very easy to monitor and easy to troubleshoot if any issues happen so for to provide the developer experience the layered architecture has a developer portal so that the develop from the dev, uh, so for a developer who are who is developing this api he can access the developer portal to get the developer experience so he, he will he will be using this portal to create these apis and uh, do all the management so uh, in this slide in this slide so we uh, i uh, i uh, we can see the actual operations of this XP, uh, api so we, uh, i explained all of these in the previous slide as well so we have experience apis process api system APIs, developer experience and governance the, this is these are the core elements of the layered architecture let's look at some of the advantages of the layered architecture so some of the advantages i have already discussed so we are segregating the responsibilities and the architecture itself it is modular is modularized 
and we can integrate to this API through standard REST interfaces. And by having a standard REST interface, we can provide this interface to third party so that they can extend the functionality on their own. And with this layered architecture, we have the flexibility to select the best technology for each layer. I mean, we, since this is not a monolithic application, sometimes the system APIs or the experience APIs can make use of different technologies so that they can get the best value out of it. Sometimes the, for system APIs, you might need to use a Microsoft microservice architecture. For uh, experience APIs, you might use a different architecture. So likewise, this layered architecture gives us a, a flexibility to choose the best technology. And as I said, it, it helps with improved monitoring and it helps with the better troubleshooting. And we can even recover if an issue happens quickly because we, we have segregated the API and if an issue happens, we know, okay, at which layer the issue happened and we can easily find, find out and uh, rectify the problem so that we can uh, have a better recovery. So let's look at some of the modern integration requirements that you need in your platform. So, so when you evaluate, so some uh, most of the time, integrations you can do it on your own. You can use a, a, a you can write a program to do the, all these integrations, but it is not scale. I mean, it is not uh, sustainable, right? So what most uh, what most companies do is they go and look at, uh, go and get an uh, integration platform from a vendor so that they know that the integration platform can be trusted so if when in a such instance we need to know okay what to look for like we need to know okay what are the uh, integration capabilities should that uh, integration platform should have so, so let's look at some of it so we know that enterprises are moving along with technological trends so at some point we have uh, take a businesses uh, using uh, ESP and now then they shifted to microservices architecture and now nowadays people are obsessed with containers and uh, container orchestration and cloud so likewise enterprises uh, based on the technology they want to always go for the better technology and they want to go with the current trend and some teams they adopt microservices architecture and some some systems so some of the systems that we have might be on premise or they can be on a cloud and some businesses they have an hybrid solution where they have some systems on their on premise and some systems on the cloud and we have different environments so the integration platform should cater to all of these needs right because we we don't know like uh, when uh, as a integration plat platform doesn't know okay what are the uh, there, there has no standard requirements so integration platform should have the capability to cater different requirements and businesses are nowadays looking to have agile development so in earlier days we used to have this waterfall model but but then the agile development came where we develop we test it and we deliver it com continuously so this CI/CD came out of it. From the, in the CI/CD, what we do is we develop a service, we continuously test it, we continuously deliver it. So the time to market is uh, the time to market is reduced. That means we can market the product in a, in a very far, in, in in a less time. And the integration platform should have the capability to have required automation. So the automation is where is. Uh, quite a couple with the CI CD process. So everything there's uh, from, from the development to the, the delivery, there's no manual process. Everything should be automated. And the integration platform should have the resiliency and have the better security. So when, when if an issue comes to an integration platform, I and mean, if there's any issue uh, occurs, then the platform should not uh, crash and have, have a downtime for all the services. The integration platform should have a better resiliency so that it can withstand those issues. And it should have better monitoring and alerting systems. So all these requirements, we can uh, affiliate it with these uh, different API layers. So some of this, uh, I mean, if you look at the experience APIs, it should have better security. It should have analytics it should have better availability because the experience API are directly consumed by the client. 
so at that level we need the security availability throttling resiliency likewise we 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 need these features at the experience api level and at in the process api level we need different kind of requirement we have different kind of requirement we we need to uh, preserve the stability we need to have a better performance because we have here is where we are going to accumulate and process the data a large amount of data so we need a better performance in this layer in the system api level the main concern is the latency because this is the level where the da data has to be fetched quickly if if there is any latency here it will be pro propagated throughout this layer and it will affect the client as well because a, a small uh, latency in the system api can have a big effect uh, have a bigger latency in the client side so all these different layers have different kind of integration requirements and the integration platform should be able to cater all these requirements i mean it might not i mean you might not be using this feature now but it is better to have the uh, feature in your system because uh, in future uh, when you grow you need this stuff so le le let's say that you are buying a phone today uh, the phone comes with the 5g technology you might not be using the 5g technology today because the service providers are not providing any uh, features for 5g but in five years time 5g might be the normal norm at that point you you uh, you can't have a 4g phone and work with it because you need to have a 5g phone so at that point you have to change your phone likewise integration platform also has to adapt to any future technology that is there i mean so if the if a technology is already there it should have the capability to address that so even if you are not using using it currently so uh, if we look at event stream processing as i said uh, earlier event stream processing is one of the uh, common pattern that enterprises are adapting nowadays because uh, data is everywhere and if all the companies are using this data to process uh, i mean to get value out of it so it is better if we can process the data in real time and get uh, the value in real time rather than uh, we collect the data and process it and get the value at the end of the day rather than doing that we need to be able to uh, process the data uh, then and there so that we can get the, the timely value so that we can outshine our competitors so in that case streaming integration is a major capability that your integration platform should have so if we, if we look at the streaming integration, uh, uh, integration architecture, so it, it, streaming integration is where you, uh, the system will be expecting continuous events of stream. So you have different kind of data, right? You can have sensor data, messaging data, emails, data from cloud, data changes from databases, file changes. So the system will be expecting a continuous event, a stream of events, and it will continuously process those data it will be it might be transforming it aggregating it cleansing it and it might be fetching data from other rest apis and it might be triggering into uh, standard integration and it it should do all that and then output this data to the uh, third uh, again it might be outputting the data to software or cloud or database likewise integration architecture is 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 is, is, is a rising technology and it is better to have that uh, ready in your integration platform so that even if you are not using it today you, might, you at one at one point when you want it you can use it uh, without any additional changes to, to your system so uh, next we are going to look at the uh, cloud uh, cloud native support for the integration platform uh, i will hand over the control to chanaka fernando chanaka fernando over to you Thank you, Arunan. I hope uh, everyone can see my screen. So I'm, I'm Chanak Fernandez. So I'm from the Solutions Architecture team. Uh, so uh, in the first half of this session, Arunan explained like uh, what is, uh, what are the, the feature functionalities uh, that we need to look when selecting an integration platform. So he went through to explain like uh, what are the the typical integration requirements and what are the modern integration requirements that have arisen with the, the modern trends in the technology. So let's see uh, one of the key trends that we see in most of the enterprise scenarios, that is the 
the evolution of the cloud technologies. So uh, before moving into the, the term cloud native, first let's understand what are the advantages of the cloud. So why people are so much uh, like uh, so much uh, obsessed with the cloud. So the reason for that is uh, basically uh, cloud is uh, something uh, that is available across the globe. So basically, regardless of where you your business resides and where you want to present your services, uh, so cloud is a global uh, global uh, like availability. So it has availability across the globe. So if you want to like uh, spin up uh, new instances or new services uh, in a completely different geographical location. If the cloud service provider has that uh, location as uh, supported locations, then you can have that service up and running in very less time. But if you think about that uh, from a perspective of an on-premise uh, kind of a scenario, uh, it will take like months to set up that server. But in the cloud, you can easily set up that and that availability is there. Then uh, with the time, like uh, depending on your business growth, so you may need to like uh, improve uh, the quality of the services and also like improve the, the number of services that you expose. So that means uh, you will expose your services to more and more people. So you need to scale up the services and uh, their performance uh, with the time. So in the cloud, you can have this uh, capability called the elasticity, where depending on the, your requirement, you can scale up as well as scale down. Uh, so that means like uh, whenever there is a, like a time period where you have a lot of interactions with your consumers, maybe like a Black Friday or holiday season, so you may get a lot of interactions from the consumers to your services. So at that time, you have to automatically scale up. But uh, during the normal uh, time periods, uh, you, you may have to scale down the services because you, you won't get the same demand from your consumers. So that is also another key aspect if you are using cloud, the elasticity. Then the scalability. So scalability tied into the elasticity. So if you want to scale the services uh, based on your business growth, so you can easily scale without uh, worrying about like setting up data centers, uh, doing networking, wiring, power supplies, everything. So you don't need to worry about those things. So you can uh, spin up new instances in the cloud service and the scalability is available to you uh, with a pretty much like uh, easier manner. Then the cost savings. So this is another, I think one of the key aspects why people are moving to the cloud. Because if you are managing and maintaining your infrastructure, security, networking, and everything, so there's a lot of uh, management cost and overhead. But if you go with a cloud vendor, you don't need any of those uh, human factors. You just have to pay based on your usage. So we call this as pay as you go. And also at the same time, uh, it will reduce the overhead of managing the infrastructure. Uh, because the the infrastructure will be managed by the cloud services provider you just have to go and use it to build your platform so because of these reasons people are moving to the cloud based approaches uh, when it comes to like uh, not only integration but all sorts of applications are moving to the cloud and even people are trying to utilize cloud based solutions as well so but this doesn't mean that you should go with a uh, like a cloud service for integration, like a like a SaaS or IPaaS kind of a solution. So that depends on different factors that we'll discuss that as. So we will discuss that as well. But this is what are the advantages of the cloud. So then uh, comes the the term cloud native. So so cloud native means uh, to reap the benefits of the cloud. So if you are designing a system to reap the benefits of the cloud. So that system, we can call that as a cloud native system or cloud native architecture. So here we are not suggesting to go with a, like a IPaaS or anything like that, because this session is about like selecting the best platform based on your requirements. So the term cloud native, like I mentioned, is to reap the benefits of the cloud. Uh, so if you are designing the uh, system or if you are selecting the integration platform that is cloud native, that means you have the flexibility to migrate to cloud at any point of time. 
so let's say you are starting the project in an on-premise infrastructure or a vm-based infrastructure but in the future if you want to migrate to the cloud and reap the benefits of the cloud so you can migrate at any point if you select the technology that is cloud native basically that has the relevant capabilities which are required to deploy on cloud at the same time you can have a no vendor looking kind of a scenario so that means if you go with a solution like an ipass so you are locked into that particular solution because that is running on their own cloud so if you want to move out of that particular solution it, it's kind of hard but if you select a platform that is not depending on any of the any of the specific cloud vendors then you can easily migrate across different uh, technology platforms it can be like a vm based deployment or cloud based deployment so depending on your use case you can migrate it easily and another key aspect is like uh, it should have this uh, concept of this container based deployment support or microservices kind of architecture because cloud uh, cloud runs in this kind of an architecture so if you look at like google cloud or any any other cloud vendors so the way they are managing these uh, large workloads is by uh, dividing the functionality to small units so in an integration world we can consider that as this uh, container based deployment so microservices kind of an architecture so that means if the integration platform that you are selecting has the support for this kind of an architecture then it will be a plus point when you are moving to a cloud based uh, system then uh, your platform should be future proof so that is a part of this uh, cloud native cloud uh, supported uh, aspect basically what we are seeing in the in industry is like more and more people are moving to the cloud whether it is an ipass or whether it is a, like a, a ias or whether it is a, something like a, a like a cloud functions or something like that so regardless of that people are moving to a model where like uh, the 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 independent services are deployed and managed so that is uh, the microservices style of architecture so those are like some of the things that we need to consider when we are selecting an integration platform that is uh, future proof so then uh, if we if we like map these concepts into the layered architecture that we discussed so this is like a, a particular uh, particular representation of uh, such an architecture so here you can see uh, in the middle so there are certain uh, certain services that we have uh, designed into these three layers so the system apis process apis and experience apis so all these uh, specific apis are designed in such a way that they can be deployed in a microservices style architecture so that means each and every service can have its own specific functionality and it can uh, deploy it can run it can scale independently so that uh, regardless of where you are running this particular service it has a specific scope and it won't impact the uh, performance of the overall system the things that we mentioned as the challenges of a like a monolithic kind of an architecture then uh, you have the event streaming capabilities so those streaming capabilities are also we can design in a microservices kind of an architecture so that we have that fl full flexibility so when we have this kind of an architecture uh, so you can basically deploy this architecture in any uh, environment whether it is uh, virtual machines uh, physical hardware or container platform or any uh, cloud service provider or an IaaS provider so that is uh, one of the key aspects with this architecture like if you design your architecture in this kind of a format it is much more flexible when it comes to supporting different environments so at the same time it will also uh, complement uh, the other platforms and systems that you have in your enterprise perimeter for example uh, on premise systems or cloud uh, applications or partner systems so all these different systems will also uh, tied into this uh, architecture so that uh, all the systems can build a, a coherent ecosystem that produce value to the users so in this particular uh, scenario like if you look at the middle section so there are the so these are the components that we need to uh, 
consider when selecting an integration platform so if you are selecting a platform that is capable of supporting this kind of an architecture that means it is uh, it is more or less cloud native uh, in the architectural support then so it's so this uh, slide describes like each and every components of that diagram uh, what are the messaging systems event processing systems uh, various apis things like that so you can have uh, the the standard uh, experiences like developer portal where you uh, interact with uh, third party users and application developers so those components does not need to be necessarily need to be in a microservices kind of a model they can be in in their own uh, model where you have like uh, one or two instances of these developer portals that that exposes uh, this uh, experience to the users and also you can have uh, other aspects like identity and access management and, and analytics platform uh, depending on their required topology uh, but it's it's essential that uh, if you are going with a cloud native kind of an approach to have the integration layer uh, to support this kind of an architecture so those are like uh, some of the requirements in terms of like feature functionality then future proof uh, then we need to look at the non functional requirements as well so those what we have discussed so far are more or less the functional requirements but when it comes to selecting a platform we need to think beyond the functionality as well so first thing we are going to discuss is the deployment options so usually the vendors provide the three main deployment options depending on which vendor you select some 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 provide all these three options and the first option is the self managed deployment so this is what we called as uh, on premise or this uh, actual deployment may be on a ias so in this scenario the user manages the entire deployment and the user have the full control of the deploy so vendor will provide support through various uh, support mechanisms like jira portals uh, ticketing applications things like that uh, but the entire uh, responsibility of managing this uh, deployment is with the uh, the user uh, in this case it's the enterprise or the business then the vendor managed deployment so that is the other end of this uh, deployment option where vendor manages the entire deployment so user has to uh, just go and consume that as a service so these are the the various uh, software as a service or ipas solutions available in the market so in this case users does not need to worry about the infrastructure management or patching upgrades these kind of activities he just have to go and use the service then the hybrid deployment so in the hybrid deployment certain components are managed by the uh, the actual user while the other components are managed by the uh, the vendor so usually the 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 division of these responsibilities are, are like called as uh, the data plane and control plane so the data plane is where actual uh, actual traffic going through or the actual data going through so usually this data plane is controlled by the the user and the control plane or the management plane uh, is managed by the the vendor so that is the hybrid model so if you are selecting an vendor so you need to decide depending on the capabilities of your team whether you are capable of managing your deployment by yourself or whether you go ahead with a vendor managed solution or depending on your certain requirements you go with a hybrid deploy then another key aspect is developer productivity so this is again a key aspect if you are selecting an integration platform because integration platform is not something that uh, like uh, so you go and just use it so basically it is something that uh, you have to utilize and build on top of that so basically you need some engineering skills to use that tool or the platform uh, so usually we see like uh, three main types of users of these integration platforms one is the programmers so programmers are the, the people who have this uh, engineering backgrounds with uh, programming knowledge and they they are willing to reuse their existing knowledge on the integration platform for example they would like to write code uh, rather than uh, doing integration with some configurations or uis and there are certain other set of users those are called the integration specialists so they are specialists on integration basically they prefer the configuration driven domain specific language driven 
approaches for integration. So if you have more, more integration specialists in your team, so you have to listen to them and you have to listen to their opinion on the platform. Then we have the citizen integrators. So these are the people comes with a strong background on a specific domain. They can be financial, banking, education, or any other domain, but they are not necessarily like uh, coming with a strong background of programming or integration cap technologies. So they will prefer a low code or no code kind of a solution where they can easily build integrations by just uh, dragging and dropping certain components, wiring up them, and basically uh, through a, a much uh, improved user experience. So these are the types of users that you have to consider when selecting an integration platform depending on your organization. Then also you have to like uh, see uh, what are the, the productivity level features that are available in this platform. How easy can these, uh, the, the integrations that you develop, how easy those can be reusable. So there should be a, some kind of a repository where the developers can go and uh, search uh, already developed services and then if there is such a service they can reuse it uh, if not they have to build from the scratch so that is a key aspect like how easily how easy to reuse an already developed uh, integration and also you should have some sort of governance uh, over the entire development process so when it comes to like uh, defining the services uh, then uh, reviewing it then implementing it then testing deployment likewise uh, if the tool provides some sort of a management and governance it's a plus point for uh, that particular tool and also it should provide like uh, a platform to engage basically they can share their thoughts they can comment on services things like that and also definitely it should support uh, modern requirements like ci cd or uh, if if it is uh, if it is uh, supporting the the containerized kind of a development approaches uh, that will also like improve the the reusability and overall performance of the of the the experience that the developers are getting because uh, if it supports docker based uh, the kubernetes based uh, uh, development then the developers can easily build their services as docker images and share across multiple teams so that uh, you can't actually say that uh, it works on my machine so that is no longer there with uh, concepts like Docker. So that means uh, the, the overall testing process and the automation process uh, becomes easier if it supports these kind of uh, technologies. And also, uh, when it comes to the developer productivity, another key aspect is the support and engagement from the vendor. So the vendor should have an excellent documentation. At the same time, it should have a good support on the community channels, for example, through the GitHub, slack or stack overflow so if you are stuck if your developers are stuck they should easily be able to access these uh, community level uh, tools and they should be able to get support immediately so in addition to the the technical support that vendor provides through the the ticketing systems and portals and also it should uh, so the the vendor should provide like uh, a good sla and uh, mttr kind of uh, values when it comes to resolving the problems so those are also critical points that you want to consider and also like the trainings and certifications so that you can easily find uh, the skilled resources when you need to develop more and more services and also if uh, they are providing some managed services so that the developers can get rid of the the actual management of the the components so that is also a good thing for developers so that they don't need to worry about the actual uh, deployment aspect then monitoring and observability is a key aspect because uh, monitoring keeps a continuous watch on the system so that if uh, if something goes wrong uh, we can act on that so at the same time observability means you should have an understanding about uh, if something goes wrong what actually went wrong and how you can recover so these aspects are also really important if you are selecting an integration platform uh, so there are like uh, open standards that uh, tools provide so that if the platform does not have a like a comprehensive monitoring and observability capability it should be able to like uh, interact with other popular tools via the interfaces that are acceptable so 
So that is another key aspect of uh, uh, selecting an integration platform. Then uh, one of the most important aspect is like the total cost of ownership and return on investment. So uh, when you are selecting a platform, you have to convince the business people. So the way you can convince the business people is by showing this, these two parameters. What is the TCO and what is the ROI? So you have to understand what is the cost of uh, from the beginning. What is the cost of evaluating the product? So can I start evaluating the product without spending money? Oh, do I need to spend money to actually start evaluating? So likewise, then the level of support available. Uh, what is the, the support level? Uh, what are the resources available? And also like you have to understand how steep the learning curve. So if it is steep, then uh, that means uh, you have to like spend more time and uh, more engineering resources. And also you have to think about like licensing subscription costs. Uh, the development support, uh, some consultancy engagement if required for like uh, not only for the initial year, but you have to think about like uh, what is the overall cost for the next three years. So these kind of aspects, then how long it will ta take to re make returns. Basically, this is about the, the time to market. How soon you can develop a service and uh, provide as a uh, basically uh, release that to the customers in production state. So that is another aspect like we have to consider what is the return on investment. Then these things sometimes you, you won't get the tangible benefits. So you some some of these things are intangible. For example, if you are exposing your integration platform to a internal consumer, then sometimes it is not easy to uh, directly show the value of this platform. But in such cases also you have to somehow find out some of the KPIs that shows the, the actual return on investment. So these are like some of the key aspects when it comes to the, the convincing business people. So then uh, so this is uh, an interesting graph where it shows like uh, there are certain projects that have inherently large ROI. So that means you have to spend a lot and you will get a lot out of it. But there are certain projects that have smaller ROI initially, but they can grow into larger ROI projects. So what, what actually happens is if you are selecting a platform that have a higher, higher starting cost, uh, the, the number of projects that you will be able to uh, start would be less. So basically you can only uh, get, uh, get started the projects that are marked in this uh, uh, blue dots but if you start a platform uh, which have a lower initial cost you can start more and more projects so what actually happens is sometimes these smaller projects that you start with a lower cost will become higher ROI projects in the future and also when you have this uh, luxury so you can do a lot of innovation within the organization uh, without like spending a fortune on a one particular project that have like higher ROI as well as a higher risk. So that is another aspect that you have to consider when selecting an integration platform. Then uh, how you can make the final decision. So we discuss uh, what are the basic functional capabilities that are required by an integration platform. Uh, then uh, what are the modern requirements? Uh, things like uh, the cloud native capabilities, uh, supporting various architecture patterns, uh, living with uh, like polyglot kind of environments, things like that. And, and also we discuss about what are the developer productivity uh, capabilities that we need to look for an integration platform. And also we discuss about the deployment choice or deployment options available. And depending on your organization, you have to select what is the better model for your organization. And then finally, we discuss uh, one of the critical aspects of like the total cost of the solution and how easily you can get the return on investment. And also we discuss about the quality of the support and the availability of this particular win. So if you are selecting an integration platform, so you have to consider all these aspects depending on your organization. So if you consider all these aspects, you will be able to select uh, the best uh, possible integration solution for your enterprise. So that would uh, conclude the session. And if you guys have any questions, 
post these questions on the the questions panel so we will answer those questions as much as possible thank you